Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I have a special treat today. That is my good friend, Rabbi Tovia Singer. For those who don't know, writ- he's written a few books. Uh, he's, let's get biblical. He sent, me, he sent me these years ago, and I started reading them, and I realized, okay, he's explaining pretty thoroughly why Jews throughout history have rejected becoming Christians. And so we're going to talk about some of those reasons, specifically talking about Paul, the Apostle Paul. So for viewers who are just now tuning in, hit the like button. I hope you can join the chat. Be respectful, I ask. And also, if you have any super chats, I hope that they're respectful as well, as we'll take those as we further proceed. This will be 60 to 90 minutes. Let's have some fun. Welcome back to Myth Vision, Rabbi Tovia Singer. Ah, great to be here. Great to see you. And um, and I say that because you were not in synagogue this Sabbath. And right. I just wanted to point that out. And this is a personal <laughs> thing, you and me. We'll talk after the show. But you have to talk after the show. I was like a show. little weird. They were reading from the Torah. It was the Ten Commandments last week. Mm. The Ten Commandments. I thought you'd be there with your white kippah. Nothing. Yeah. That's all. <sighs> I hate to say this, but there was a bacon turkey sandwich luring me away. And you know me, you know me, a little bit of bacon and I'm out the door. Um, I'm teasing. Uh, So the Apostle Paul is... Would be very happy with your bacon eating. That's true. Yes, he would approve. He would approve. I don't know if I care about his approval today, but you know. Right. Yeah. So he's he's obviously got everything figured out, correctly understands the Torah, um, and he is giving the accurate representation of the Messiah here in the New Testament. Oh, yeah. Or did I get that backwards? No. Um, see, Paul, Paul was not in favor of uh, the observance of the Torah, but he had to, given that he was... Um, selling his iteration. I mean, the word Christianity doesn't appear in the Christian Bible. Because he was selling it, he had to, and not only does Paul have to, but all the authors of the Christian Bible uh, need to demonstrate the veracity of their claim in through the Hebrew Bible. They're all doing this. So Paul is our earliest surviving Christian literature. Um John Revelation, uh, that's the end, at least the end of the first century. They're all doing this. So mm-hmm. John um, has Jesus say that, you know, if you would have believed in Moses, you would have believed in me because he wrote about me. And Paul's doing the same thing, except Paul is very deliberately misquoting the Hebrew Bible. And um, if we're Paul and in- Matthew. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I was just going to say, we're going to get yeah. into examples I'm sure that you have highlighted. But an analogy recently, I came up with one that made a lot of sense to me. Tell me if you think I'm hot or cold on this. That is, if someone today were to say, listen, um, Elvis Presley or Tupac Shakur uh, has told me some things he never told people when he was around on Earth. And uh, it's kind of a revelation, actually. In fact, it it disagrees with what the earlier people who were around when he was alive, that he was telling them. Uh, I'm going to give you some of these insights that come directly from Elvis or directly from Tupac. You would imagine most people who were not raised indoctrinated in that particular movement would hesitate and go, hold on. You're saying you're talking to Elvis and Elvis is telling you like updated information about things and you're trusting this guy. We wouldn't do that for someone who did that for Tupac or for Elvis after. He never met the guy. So wouldn't that already raise red flags to be cautious? Right. So Paul actually takes us a step further than your examples. So perhaps we might be charitable and say, well, maybe this person met Elvis a long time ago or Tupac not that long ago. Paul makes claims that the Jewish Bible says that uh, that the Messiah died of your sins, he was buried, and he was raised on the third day, and it says that in the Hebrew Bible. 
This is the most famous chapter in all of Paul's letters, 1 Corinthians 15. And there's no one who questions whether Paul is the author of this letter. As it turns out, we have the Hebrew Bible. It's nearly 24,000 passages. So the Hebrew Bible is huge, much, much larger than the Christian Bible. And there's, there is no, these passages don't exist. So Paul takes it a step further. Perhaps someone spoke to Elvis in 1972. I mean, I remember the day that Elvis died. So maybe someone spoke to Elvis, or maybe someone found a, a note. But here, Paul is making the claim that the Hebrew Scripture says that the Messiah is supposed to die for your sins, And the Hebrew Bible, of course, teaches that the innocent cannot die for the sins of the wicked. And he would be buried. He would be in the tomb for three days and rise on the third, according to the Scripture. He repeats that in verse 3 and again in verse 4. And as it turns out, these are phantom verses. They don't exist anywhere. So this is much more falsifiable than your Elvis example. And I am convinced of this. I can't, I could not possibly have been the first person to notice this. Someone must have written this before. Um, But there's no doubt that the author of Luke is copying this because Luke, at the very end of the book, at the very last chapter, at the end of the last chapter in Luke 24, verse 44, Luke outlines the exact same thing. Jesus is speaking here. So if you had a red-letter Bible, it would be in red. And Jesus is saying, look at the Torah, look at the prophets, look at the the Psalms, which means the Ketuvim, the writings. The Messiah says, die and rise on the third day. Read it for yourself, 24, 44 through 46. So the, the example of the Christian Bible is really much more severe because it actually invents passages that don't exist. Paul's letter, 1 Corinthians, was written somewhere in the 50s. Luke is hard to say when it was written, but it was written at least mid-80s. That's very conservative. And there are many people, for good reason, think that Luke was written in the second century. Uh, Whenever it was written, it was written half a century later. So Luke, no doubt, is copying this because it's the same thing. The idea of completely inventing passages, and then people wonder, well, why are the Jews blind that we don't believe in Jesus? Is there a veil of her eyes? And this, this is the language of Paul, because Paul has to explain away why don't the Jews believe this. This is a big issue in the Christian Bible. Why do the very people who can read these books in its original language, um, they're the only ones waiting for a coming of Messiah, Jews have a reputation of being fairly clever. Why don't they believe this? And the Christian Bible, as you know, is going to spend a lot of time explaining the Jews are the children of the devil. That's less flattering in um, John 8, um, John 8, 44. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a veil over their eyes in 2 Corinthians. They're blind, 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. All Told sorts you, of I, explanations. If I may add to this, I could I can imagine someone saying, well, those verses were there. We haven't found the text that they were. Wouldn't that be a little more embarrassing that that wasn't reserved or there wasn't preserved for for the readers uh, later on to find this? If you're someone who <clears throat> believes God's going to preserve his word, kind of shocking it we don't have it. So why I mean I could imagine someone trying to speculate that well yes he would there, there are people who do that. There are people there there are, uh, MacArthur does that on a few occasions like in at the very end of Matthew's infancy narrative Matthew's infancy narrative ends with Jesus uh, is co- is comes from the city of Nazareth because uh, um, Matthew has a family start in Bethlehem and wind up in Nazareth and he'll be called a Nazarene because it says so in the Bible, and there is no such passage in the Bible. So there are a number of them who say, ah, uh, they said it, but it just didn't make it into the canon. It didn't make it into the scriptures. That might work for someone who is not familiar with the claims of the New Testament. The claim of the New Testament is, read your Bible, Jesus is there. He's bouncing off every page. Second Timothy Three very specifically says that 
it is the scripture that is used for edification teaching, 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, John 8, uh, John 5, 46, the claim is made to the Jews, if you would have um, believed in Moses, meaning it's there, you would have believed in me because he spoke about me. So that's not the claim. That's a that's a vacuous claim. It, this is, you know what this is like? This is like watching a seven-year-old do a magic show. And you're just watching it and just going, I can't believe I'm... This is not David Blaine. This is not Broadway. This is just a, a very poor example of sleight of hand. And because the kid's your nephew and your sister will kill you if you don't say something nice, you say, oh, it was brilliant, it was great. But that's what's going on. The Christian Bible is saying, as it says, according to the prophets, the Messiah will be born of a virgin, Matthew 1, 22 and 23, because it actually says this. It doesn't say that these are passages that don't exist. And moreover, one other point, just as a side, and I want the viewers to understand how to think, if these are verses that don't exist, but in the text, they're hidden verses, which reeks of Gnosticism, these hidden mysteries, then what religion could be falsified then? I mean, aren't the our evangelical friends telling us that there are 365 verifiable passages in the Old Testament that prove that Jesus is the Messiah? They don't, that's not the advertisement. That's, you know, when you look at the ad, you actually hope that when you walk into store order on Amazon, so the thing shows up. The claim is made sola scriptura. Ah, but then we come to these passages and we're told this is a, a verse that just never made it into the canon, but that's not what I was sold on. That's what I was bought in on. But that's what goes on. So bait and switch. So let's discuss a few things. You you actually helped me with the title. You said, look, you need to let them know you have no idea of how wrong Paul was. And so you brought up an example of a passage that is a phantom passage. It doesn't exist. Um, it's crafted or invented, potentially grabbing ideas from several different locations and inventing kind of his own scripture here that isn't there in the actual original text that he's using. Are there any other examples that you can give us before we get into Q&A that to you highlight this coercive effort on his part to fulfill in Jesus prophecies or scripture and kind of sell his own little cult? A chapter that should not sit well with the church uh, is found in Deuteronomy chapter 30. The context is the end of the five books of Moses, essentially, is we're told that I want you to know, it's a personal letter, that keeping the commandments is not difficult. It's not hard. You can do it. I'm not kidding. So there's a chapter almost envisioning the book of Romans, saying because Paul is saying you can do it. You're a sinner. You're lost. Original sin. All that. So. There's an entire chapter in the Torah that's devoted to telling you that you can actually keep these commandments. Do not say in your heart um, who will go to heaven to bring it to us, who's going to go over the sea to bring it. It's not too hard. It's not too difficult. You can do it. And verse, that's how verse 14 ends. Verse 14 ends, the word is near to you. These commandments are near to you so that you can do it. Very simple passage. Now, you probably think that Paul would stay very far away from this because the essence of the of Pauline theology is that man is sinful, man is spiritually depraved, and he could do nothing to save himself. There's no effort, no initiative. And incidentally, if you hear what I'm saying now, and it seems odd to you, or strange to you, you the viewer, that means you've never been to a church in your life, because that this is what's preached every Sunday. This is what goes on in every Bible class. I'm not straw manning. I'm steel manning this. That there's nothing you can do to keep these commandments. So you think that this pass, these this passage, Deuteronomy 30 verse 14, would would not be found anywhere in the Christian Bible. Strangely, it's found in the Christian Bible. It's found in the Book of Romans, Paul's most influential epistle. And in Romans chapter 10. 
Paul quotes it, but he actually cuts off the end. How does the passage actually end? In Deuteronomy chapter 30, it ends, the word is it, la soisi, that you can actually do it. That's what it says. But what does Paul do? He literally takes out the words that you can do it. He just cuts it out, just deletes it, just blows it up, but it eviscerates it. So that's the whole point. The whole point is that you can do it. But Paul can have that in the text. Why? Look, these people who preach Reformed theology, it's, they didn't invent that. This is hyped up, amped up Pauline theology. It's Augustinian theology. You can't do it. Reform theology goes further and say, you just were chosen not to do it. You can't, because you can't even believe in Jesus. It's mind blowing. But in any case, so this is an, a, a, an example of how the text was altered in order to make it appear Christological. A, a moment ago, we talked about verses that were invented out of whole cloth. Now we're looking at parts of verses that are eviscerated in order to hide the original message. So it's the exact opposite. That's an interesting observation, especially if he's trying to sell it to an audience who right. isn't interested in buying what the law sells to begin with. So now he has to manipulate in a way or, you know, I've had some scholars I've read who entertain the idea that, Paul is doing everything he can to sway his Gentile audience away from observing the law because he wants as many of them as possible to come in. And how do you do that? Well, you of course, circumcision's off the table. The list goes on in terms of any of the difficulties and uh, coming up with some of that. But um, I wanted to ask you, have you ever heard that joke? I did a video on hell with um, Dr. Dennis R. McDonald, and he was telling a joke about about hell and this Lutheran pastor goes there and he goes, there must be a mistake. You need to check the records. Satan goes and looks at the computer goes, you know what? We've had some errors recently glitches. Let's check it out. If it's if you're really not meant to be here, we'll send you to heaven. So then he goes and goes to the waiting area and he notices this guy dressed in a toga. And he goes, you look like this guy, Paul that we have on icons. And in Greek, he says, I am Paul. And he's like, what? what the heck? Then he sees this guy next to him. He sees this, what looks like St. Augustus and uh, St. Augustine. Sorry. And then he's like, um, it's me. It's yeah, it's me. St. Augustine. What is going on here? And then he sees Luther and he's asking like, what's going on? And in German, I am Luther. And then Luther turns to him and goes, listen, it was works after all. <laughs> so anyway, I thought it was a great joke. You never heard that one? Yeah, the Jews have a different level of comedy than the Gentiles do. This is a, our domain. This is a very <laughs> special feat. So when non-Jews try to move into our business, they get into trouble. But, right. Um, yes, I, I just would just give out a caution here to all our good viewers. But, yeah. So he's he's selling the idea, though, back to Romans. Some right, but, but here's the key. I want to expand because you said something that's very, uh, very important. Mm -hmm. you know, Judaism is a popular religion in the first century in the empire. There are a lot of people who want to be Jewish. Remember, at the time, Judaism was the only monotheism in the world. There was no other, there was no other game in town if you wanted monotheism, not henotheism, monotheism, only one God, only. So, Jews are popular, so if someone was thinking about converting to Judaism and found the gods of the empire to be um, unpersuasive, what might slow down a conversion process? What might get in the way? Well, for half of the population, as you alluded to, circumcision. That would, as it turns out, about two thirds of the people who do convert to Judaism are women. Um, Maybe that contributes to it. The other is just keeping commandments. As you alluded to earlier, you enjoy bacon. So if you have Judaism, which is a, a popular religion in the empire, and today it's sort of an end thing, what would get in the way of someone going through with the conversion to Judaism? It's circumcision and ritual commandments, and that's what Paul does. He removes those two. 
And he said, you don't need that at all. And let no one tell you about it, you know, what you eat, you drink, and your holidays and festivals, because the law is only a shadow. Paul says this. Paul says that the law is only a shadow. The essence is Christ. Colossians um, 2, so 2 verses 16 and 17. So he's very explicit, and whoever wrote Hebrews almost copies that. So Paul is saying that you can have Judaism, remember we don't have the word Christianity in the New Testament, you have Judaism without the problem, circumcision, commandments, and bingo, you have an explosion. That's why Paul wins in the end. Like, why did Paul win and his opponents, who Paul talks about in every one of his letters, why did they lose? Paul wins because he's selling Judaism without the problem circumcision and ritual commandments he's antinomian bingo you have christianity and that's what now, happened if i i want to ask you if you think there's any connection with there are early parties of jews who were trying to spiritualize thanks to platonic philosophy and they were saying stuff mm -hmm. like well you had it all wrong sorry we misinterpreted this stuff the original don't eat pigs and don't do this and don't do that really meant don't act like. And so they reinterpreted it in like this higher supposed sophisticated spiritual way. And therefore right. these were certain Jews that um, Philo of Alexandria seemed to have encountered whom he disagreed with. And he was already pretty platonic. Right. Do you think Paul is right. fitting into that extreme category of a, of like a really fringe group? Or do you think he has a whole nother agenda, even more malicious than that. Cause it sounds like you think he's got more, um, I guess the word would be malicious or at least a coercive attempt on creating a cult, even if he has to fabricate data to do so. Right. So Paul was living in an environment with that, these ideas, it's like the millenarian groups at the end of the 19th century, Seventh-day Adventists, all these groups are emerging, apocalyptic groups that are emerging that have the same kind of genre. So Paul is there and Paul is developing what already pre-existed. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And to say that um, you shouldn't eat pig, uh, but the Bible doesn't mean that actually in Leviticus 11, but it means don't behave like a pig. That mm -hmm. argument is made in a book that didn't make it into the Christian canon, might have, it would have been a nightmare for Jews, and that's the Epistle of Barnabas. The, the core arguments, fiercely anti-Jewish, even by Christian standards, is that the Jews never understood their own Bible, and it, when it said this, it meant something else completely so right. So Hellenism already would have been trying to spiritualize very clear texts in the Bible, for sure. Paul is, is synchronizing other ideas that are very popular, and that's Gnostic ideas, that there's, you alluded to this earlier, that there is secret knowledge, that only if you have it, you would not only discover who you are, but how to escape this wretched world. And, and Paul goes so far as to say that if the people of the era, era of Jesus, if they would have known the secret that I have, they would have never uh, crucified Christ. In his language, if the, the rulers of the epoch, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. It's a, this is a mind, this is, this is 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 and 8. This is mind-blowing. Paul is saying that the generation was so corrupt, they crucified Christ because they thought they were killing our Savior. If They're really enemies of God. If they would have known that this was the whole plan after all, they would have never crucified our, our Lord of glory, which is, I'll tell you why this is insane, because Christians insist that the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, excludes explicitly prophesizes that the Messiah is supposed to die. Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Daniel 9, you know them all. Well, mm -hmm. if that's the case, then what is Paul talking about if there was always an Isaiah 53? But Paul then says, this is a mystery it's, um, that only I have access to. I didn't go to Jerusalem, after all. I went to Arabia and first... Um, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 17. What is he talking about? Or he went on a Hajj to Mecca? No. He just wants you to know, I don't, I don't need the, 
the Jerusalem church. I don't need them. I get my stuff directly from Jesus Christ. And it's all mysteries, and it's mysteries that, that could save you. This is, you could sniff out the Gnosticism here. Gnostic Christianity is going to explode in the second century. It's going to take it much further. Gnostic Christianity is going to dump the entire Hebrew Bible altogether. And that's that becomes a, an issue for the early church. But everything is building to the next. Paul, as you pointed out, is building from one piece to the next level to the next level. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got quite a bit of questions that have been coming in. I'm afraid with our 90 minute cutoff that if we don't start now, Rabbi, the end right. might come. And some people may get left outside of the pearly gates. Yeah. Right. I'm in Jerusalem, so I'm good. That's a good one. That's a good one. Okay. Um, yeah, let's go. Let's just start with these questions. And I ask everybody be polite, uh, be respectful, we'll try to stay on topic pertaining to New Testament stuff. This is why these shows, I think, happen it is not only am I respectful to Rabbi, but also, you know, we found common ground. We have, I get a lot of Christians, by the way, who really hate that I have you on, and even some skeptics probably like, what are you doing? And it's like, what do you mean? I, I don't can't. have. There's no it. way you're making that up. There's no way there are people who don't like me. What are you talking about? Stop it. Well, no, no, no. There's some. You know, like every group, there's some. Really? But there's a lot of people who who watch you. <laughs> okay. Are, you know what? You I want to hear something crazy? You want to hear something nutty? You want to hear something Tell crazy? Me. I'm in a in a bomb shelter right now. I'm not kidding. Not kidding. So I can't reach it, but that's steel. No, so. Every home has a bomb shelter built into it. It's like one of your rooms. It's a bomb shelter. So this room in my house what is the bomb shelter. It just happens to be. I mm -hmm. mean, that's like like three inches of steel. I don't know what it is. Whatever it is, it's, I never right. tested it. So I'm actually in a bomb shelter. Let's, let's continue. Go ahead. Okay. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I, I found common ground on going through the New Testament, yes. and you have quite a bit yes. of insight on studying this. So I need to remind, just this came to my mind, I'm interviewing Bart Ehrman this uh, Thursday. He's got a Gospel of Matthew uh, course he's about to do. And I need to poke some things, get some good questions from you pertaining to the anti-Semitism that you notice in Matthew, because most scholars think it's an in-group, out-group. So it's just a, ver a certain Jews are arguing against other Jews, and that's what you see here. But they'll say John's anti-Semitic. So we need to talk about that, but that's later, later. Um, Dr. Goon 23, thank you for becoming a new member. I appreciate it. Feels good to have real salvation now, doesn't it? Uh, thanks seriously though, for being a member. JC, if Saffron, and thank you for the super chat, if Saffron and biblical was referred to by the SPR route, might Ezekiel have eaten a roll of Saffron instead of a roll of writing? No, because, well, the, you're talking about Ezekiel. It's really gorgeous, Ezekiel chapter 2 and chapter 3. And what comes into view there is he's eating writing. It's not any writing, but he's eating. He, he sees a scroll, and he's told to eat it. And on both sides of the parchment are contain the lamentations of all the bad things that can happen to the Jews. Not kidding. And Ezekiel swallows it and goes into his stomach, and it's sweet like honey. So uh, Ezekiel, for those who don't know, lived at the time of the destruction of the first temple, a very traumatic time. And one-third of the book of Ezekiel is devoted to explaining why the temple was destroyed. So Ezekiel's there. It's not related to Saffron. It's related to that all the difficulties and the vicissitudes that the Jews endure ultimately are sweet and ultimately contribute to our growth and strength. Good question. Beautiful chapter. Crazy chapter break from three to four. But brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, JC. Is it uh, Masara? Thank you for the super chat. If Daniel 9 predicts with details the destruction of Second Temple, why then are academic scholars atheists? Well, I think you should ask an atheist that question. Um, so atheists read the end of Daniel 9 as not the destruction of the sanctuary, but rather the abomination 
of the defilement of the sanctuary under Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, who was the person who who defiled Judaism. He was our spiritual enemy. So far be it from me to represent that view. The end of Daniel 9 very explicitly, and I'm talking about verse 26, describes literally the destruction that of the city of Vair of Hakodesh Yashchus, that literally the Beis Hamidrash is destroyed. So the way so what a scholar would say who is not a uh, not religious uh, would say is that this is referring to Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth rather than um, Titus and Vespasian. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate the super chat. Equal How scale. Did I do on that? that was did I handle huh? that? Yeah. I no, I had. To, this is the first time I ever had to explain what atheists believe, but. Yeah. yeah, it's you got to try to know what everybody thinks. I was like, you're... trying. Uh, all right, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no worries. Go ahead, my... uh, sure. Equal skills with the super chat. Shalom, Rabbi. Paul claimed he was a Pharisee, student of Gamaliel. Is there proof? Yes. Heard there's a student list by Gamaliel. Is Paul on it? Okay, this is like a really, whoever you are, you're smart. So that's a really good question. So as it turns out, Paul never claims to be a student of Gamaliel. If Paul claimed to be a student of Gamaliel, he would have been laughed out of town. Gamaliel lived at the time of Paul. He lived in the first half of the first century, and he was Einstein. He was just the giant. And in fact, the Christian Bible is... He's the only non-Christian Jew who's spoken of in a very flattering way. Now, the, Paul doesn't make the claim because he can't make the claim because that's how well known. This is the person who's the head of the Sanhedrin. If you were a student of his, it's like you're a student of Teller. I mean, that would be insane. That claim is made by the by the or whoever wrote the Book of Acts, because by the time the Book of Acts is written, so conservatively, the Book of Acts is written. I don't know. 85, 90, I mean, somewhere, that's very conservative. I mean, many people believe Acts is a second century yeah. iteration, but we'll stay, but it's, it's, we're just staying. So by the time Acts is written, let's just be very conservative and say 85, that means the book of Acts is written three decades after Paul's letters. People are dead. I mean, there's no way to look. So, so the Acts makes that claim. And the reason why the book of Acts is, speaks of Gamaliel in very flattering terms is because they're saying that Paul was a, fair, a student of his. So if, he, if Gamaliel is a, bear, is, a, is a no good guy, so that, what is it, how does that reflect on, on Paul? Now, what's very striking about Acts 5 as an example is that Gamaliel... See, this is where the, you know, there's the, the shlemiel and the shlemazel in Jewish uh, thinking. The shlemiel is the guy who drops the banana peel, and the, the shlemazel is the person who trips over it. So th there's kind of a lot of that going on where the New Testament trips over itself. In the story of Gamliel, Gamliel says that, Christians like Peter shouldn't be persecuted because if what they believe is not of God, it'll fall of its own. And Peter's iteration of Christianity did fall. The, the Torah observant Christianity didn't stick around. So Paul is going to always, at all times, going to insist that he's a Pharisee of Pharisee. That he makes, that case he must make. He makes that famous, most famous sources for that is. Let's all pick his letters that are indisputed. Uh, uh, Philippians chapter 3, Galatians 1 and 2. And why is Paul doing this? Why is he saying that he was more zealous than any of his peers? Why is he doing this? Because he's got opponents all over the place. He has enemies on all sides who were saying exactly that, that Paul's fake. He's a phony. He's What he's teaching is ungodly. So Paul has to explain, for instance, to the churches in Asia Minor, the, 
his letter to the churches in uh, the book of the letter to the Galatians as an example. He spends two chapters explaining why Peter's a crook, and he told it to Peter to his face in Galatians uh, one. I think it's um, I think it's verse eleven. I think. So he's constantly explaining why everyone else is inferior to him, and that he is a, and therefore follow what I'm saying, you foolish Galatians, Galatians 3 verse 1. So that's why Paul is constantly pushing for that he's a Pharisee. Now, the word Pharisee is an anachronism. It just means an Orthodox Jew. So if you know what Orthodox Jews are, so that's the gold standard in the entire Christian Bible, the Pharisees. Unless your righteousness exceeds the Pharisees and the scribes, the Sermon of the Mount. It's like not the Sadducees, the Pharisees. They're the ones who get it directly from Moses, Matthew 23, 1 and 2. So Paul is going to make this claim because people are considering him to be a fake and a phony, and that comes off in Acts. And I know some of you may be wondering, well, why am I using the Christian Bible to prove things when I don't believe that the Christian Bible is reliable? It's true. But there is one standard that all scholars will concede you can take to the bank on historicity, and that's the criteria of embarrassment. There would be no reason in the world why Paul's vicious um, conflicts with his with fellow Christians uh, would ever be inserted in the book of Acts or in Paul's letters. It just it doesn't make sense. Not just fellow Christians. We we talk about the epistle of Barnabas, which is a, a pseudepigrapha. But the actual Barnabas was Paul's buddy. In fact, Barnabas is the guy that got Paul the connection to the Jerusalem church. Right? And his cousin is John Mark, and Paul has a fight with both of them. How likely is that as someone would have invented that? No, that's very embarrassing. So Paul can't get along with anyone. We've met people like this who can't get along with people. That's Paul. Paul is not the guy you want to have dinner with. So uh, Paul is constantly has to display for all to see his credentials to show why his Christology is correct and his opponents are wrong. And Paul wins for the reason I explained earlier. Thank you. Thank you. We have quite a few here, Rabbi. So <clears throat> um, I don't know how brief you're able to be on some of them, but uh, just keep that in mind as we move forward. Thanks. Israelite Christianity, thank you for the super chat. Are the embarrassing stories about Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Aaron found in the Torah solid evidence for the historicity of the Torah's narratives, in your view? I added in your view because... Are the embarrassing stories... Right, so the Torah is very interested in showing every mistake that we've made. Um, there is a, a saying that the Hebrew Bible was either written by God or an anti-Semite. It's, it's very self-critical, and all of our leaders are hit very hard, Moses, David. And, and what makes, what I, I'll just, this point I think will mean a lot to you viewers, what makes the Hebrew Bible so drastic, dramatically different than the Christian Bible is that, that all of our leaders are, are people who are deeply flawed, King David, flawed. Once Paul becomes a Christian, he can do nothing wrong. Jesus could do nothing wrong. Peter is a little bit of a shlomazel in the Christian Bible for other reasons. So the the Jewish Bible is very, very self-critical because it's trying to show you what not to do and all the mistakes of our leaders. We don't have any virgin births in the Jewish Bible. Everybody is real, and I can relate to David because he's made mistakes and I have too, but I can get right. Thank How you. Was that Thank you. For... Appreciate that. Sure. Israelite Christianity again said, in my opinion, all the Pauline epistles are forgeries. Why are you certain that Paul wrote the seven undisputed letters? I'm convinced that, that Paul wrote more than seven. Uh, so this is very important. Unlike any other letter in the Christian Bible, any other document in the Christian Bible, Paul's letters have enormous texture to it. 
the personality of Paul comes through on those seven indisputed letters. They're very different than the Gospels. The Gospels, first of all, what we have are layers and layers and layers. The fewest layers is Mark, the earliest chronologically of the Gospels. You don't get a sense, Derek, you, you or I wouldn't get a sense of reading the book of Matthew of who really wrote this book. We, it's not that we don't know it. There's, we, it's just hard to feel out who is, the, who is this editor who's taking these sources and putting it together. It doesn't come mm -hmm. through because there's so many layers. But Paul's letter, Paul had a temper. We talk about him having a temper, which he had. He had a temperament. He was, he, he's not systematic like the, the epistle the author of the Epistle to the Hebrews, he's very temperamental, he's very angry, he changes from one direction to the other. He has a, a very striking personality. As I mentioned, he's not someone you'd want to hang out with. Um, when we say seven indisputed, so those are indisputed, but many, many scholars would consider it's that it's quite possible that Paul contributed to other epistles Ephesians, Colossians could have contributed to it. After all, Romans 16, 22, Paul, we know that there's someone else who worked with Paul on putting together the book of Romans. So, But Paul's personality is there, screams, not only his theology, his style. So Very technically, good. it gets back to the criterion of embarrassment in a way, uh, in your opinion, which helps Paul is very angry. He doesn't like to be disrespected. He doesn't like it if you don't respect him. He would hate the show. He would be very angry at you, Derek. Not me. You. I'm in a I'm in a rocket proof building here. <laughs> he would be he would be very upset. You know, I just do this. In Galatians 4, this is like crazy. I think it's verse 12. Galatians 4, is it 12 or 14? Paul said, you know, when I was sick, he says, he writes to these people, he says, you know, when I was sick, when I came to the last time, you really took care of me. You treated me with such honor as though, he says, I was an angel of the Lord, as though I was Jesus Christ himself. He says that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, you treat, like, what do you, why, why would you doubt my authority? That's, that's who we're dealing with. Here. That's the kind of, and we can't sniff out Paul. Of course you can. It, his, I mean, it, Hebrews is so different. Hebrews is highly systematic, very thought out. There's none of this going on in Hebrews. How the church fathers got sold on the notion that Hebrews was written by Paul is mind-blowing. They were sold on it, and that's why it made it into the canon. Thank you. Thank you. Israelite Christianity again is back. Most archaeologists claim the conquest narratives of Joshua contradict the archaeological data. Are they lying or are they misrepresenting the data? What are your thoughts? You know, you know, Derek. I think you would know about this more than my, cause, me because I I have no background in archaeology. Uh, that's just not my field at all. When you go to rabbinical school, we don't study archaeology. Just take my word for it. It does. From the archaeologists, we both know they will tell you how difficult archaeology is. Archaeologists, I mean, people at the top in their field, will tell you that. Doing archaeology is like having a puzzle, a thousand-piece puzzle, but you're only given two pieces and there's no picture in the front. Mm. That's the classic description, right? It's This is not like, all right. Like, I remember once I was going to go scuba diving in Bali. So I called up the dive shop. I said, what's the water temperature? I want to know what kind of wetsuit to bring. He said, it's 29 degrees. I said, what is that? He said, I don't know. So I went on Google and I found out whatever that is. It's pretty, very warm for water. I mean, that's, you know, like you can look it up exactly. Archaeology is not this kind of thing. And that's why there are so many different opinions. And there are different views in that community who have a different worldview. And you can, and that's why there's so many adjustments. That's why there, you have the same personalities that have one worldview who are, who are, are from a minimalist world, so they have that. And you have other people who have a different worldview who might view it differently. I mean, why are they arguing so much? People like doctors are not arguing if cigarette smoking is dangerous or not, because the reason is that there's enough room in there where people can interpret it based on their worldview, and that's why you can consistently predict who would view things that way and the other way. You know, This is not my field of expertise, but it's very clear what's happening there. 
Thank you. Thank you. Israelite Christianity, last one by them for now. Where in Isaiah does the servant of Yahweh represent the righteous remnant of Israel? And where does the servant represent the whole nation? Okay. Um, if you're writing it down, so Isaiah 41, verse 8 and 9. Now, uh, so that's Israel, the nation, and it's compared to in these passages to Abraham, who God loved. That's where it comes from. Isaiah 42, verse 6, Israel isn't uh, mentioned in that passage, but it's um Brit Am to a covenant nation. Now, this so frequently mistranslated as a, a covenant to the nation, but the Librit is to the covenant nation. So you, Isaiah 43, this is very important for you. 43, verse 10, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. Atem Avdi no Mashem. Uh, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen. So you should know, believe in, and say that I am Lord, there's no one besides me. Uh, by the way, if you go back to 42 and 19, you see that the servant is fragile. It means who is blind, but my servant, who is deaf, my servant. Isaiah, we'll go through it very fast. Isaiah 44, verse 1, 44, 21, 45, 4, 48, 20, 49, 3. But what's interesting, I'd like to point you to 49, verse 5 and 6, where the servant is told to bring back the rest of the tribes of Jacob. And there you see it's the remnant of Israel, not all of Israel. Because the remnant is told to bring back the rest of the Jews, not just the Gentiles. Or Lagoyim is appears in forty nine six as well. So I just encourage people to read through the servant songs. It's really beautiful stuff. Thank you, Tovia. Thank you, thank you. Michael Beverly says, "Hey guys, love the rabbis' talks. I've got a live stream with Mike Lacona tomorrow. What's the top resurrection question? The woman with spices after the burial, or something else?" Not a gotcha so much, but a, a discussion question. Look, I don't even understand how... I don't understand why someone would believe that women would do a tahira on a man's body. Would, would excuse me, would bring, would put spices and anoint a dead man's body. There's so many things wrong with this. So, and I encourage you to look at the first, this is an easy way to remember it, just the last chapter of Mark and the last chapter of Luke. Okay. Just do that. Start right there because that's where it pops in. So in those two, now John repairs this. John has Nicodemus uh, prepare the spices before the Sabbath. If you notice, so John fixes this problem. But this is a massive issue. Why would you put spices on a dead body if it's in the tomb for three days? Why Why are spices put on a body? I mean, just simple. Women performing a, a tahira, which is a sacrament. It's just washing the body, anointing the body. So women always do that for women, men for men. It just would never happen. Do you have any idea what a dead body looks like after it's been entombed for three days? In fairly moderate weather, Jerusalem has very, very nice warm weather, about nine months a year. Do you know what a dead body looks like after three days of decay, which begins immediately. Why Why are you anointing a decaying body? It doesn't even, the story doesn't make sense. These are, this is a plot device that was, had to just be rebuilt. So I can't tell you what to ask, you know, Mike. I just, people miss this. And you know why? I want to make this point. The reason why people miss this and scratch their head on this point is because unless you grew up in the Jewish world, as a religious Jew, so this is like a part of you, just like you're an American, so you know exactly, you know, how popular baseball is versus badminton. I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, like you understand the American culture right? in a way because you, so as a Jew, you, you sniff this out immediately. Like, this is a complete contrivance. 
why there's no way that women are going to why would you anoint a body that's decaying for three days why where did you even get that from i don't, I don't want to take too much time spices were is not in the bible as a commandment but spices were used to mask the smell of a decaying body bring the body to interment so as not to um, so there shouldn't be a bazillion hamesh so that the body shouldn't smell. But once it's in the tomb, why are you bring that is completely convoluted and it's all a plot device. And people miss it and I don't know why. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. I've got another question here <clears throat> if you feel comfortable answering. Eunice and Cleon, thank you so much for the super chat. Tovia, tell us your opinions of gay men LGBT. I. I talk to them every day and and I think most rabbis do and the the people who who ask me for help like every rabbi is asked for help right and it's it's a lot of pain that's what it is now granted that my exposure is only to people who come to me who are Either they're religious people who feel whatever reason. I even the people of other faiths come to me, and I think it's because they're uncomfortable speaking to someone in their own faith because they don't want it to be found out. So I get messages from people who really are hurting and really are struggling. And and I you know, can't go into no two are the same. This is not like people have A, B, C, D. Each case is just a lot of pain there, a lot of hurt, a lot of shame, a lot of struggle. Each person's different. So for me and for rabbis out there, and I presume this is going on in, for um, pastors and so on, for me, it's understanding what hurt is and understanding what pain is. And it's helping people navigate a very, very challenging world. That's what it is for me. For me, it's about someone who's who's broken inside and hurting. That's what I think. So we we want to. But I don't I don't look for new customers or anything like that. But I don't know. Do I get two hundred and fifty emails a day? Probably. I don't know. Whatever it is, there are people hurting out there. That's the answer to your question. That's what I think. Thank you for the super chat. Appreciate it. Stop scamming, man. Hello, Tovia. Is this an accurate summary of the Talmud? It consists of the Mishnah, oral Torah, which is scriptural, and records of discourse among many Jews with differing views, which isn't scripture. I'm going to step away for a second while you answer that. Right. So I need to explain this. So the Talmud is the largest document of antiquity with more than 70 volumes. This is just massive. So is the Mishnah? The Mishnah has a lot of things. And I'll give you just an example of it. So the, what's happening is we have a principle in the Torah. And the question is, what are the extremes? Uh if I can use uh, something you'd be familiar with, wherever you live, there are laws that prohibit people who've consumed a certain amount of alcohol from operating a motor vehicle, right? Um, but the question is how much alcohol would impair you, right? So whatever it is, right? So what the Talmud is very interested in doing, we have the principle that if you're, if you're impaired by not just alcohol, but so it's it's illegal to to operate a motor vehicle, okay? But what's considered impairment? What is the alcohol blood level? What are the extremes? Now, incidentally, if you're a pilot, it's a different standard because the consequences are even much greater than. So, so as an example, I'll give you an example. We have in the Torah principle that a man must take a woman and that the oral law is that he gives her something of value. All right. He gives them the The question, of course, is think. What is, what is the minimum amount of val value that he can give her? Okay. So this is the good, this is how, this is Kedushan. This is the tractate, which is devoted putatively because they actually, all the Talmud is all over the place. 
about the laws of getting married. But how much, to, I understand the valuable gold ring, for sure, there's no question if he gives us something. But the question is, what's the smallest amount of value where you have a marriage? This is very critical, is if he gives a lesson that they're not really married, which wouldn't be a problem, but it has a big impact if they have children. If they, all right. Anyway, so there is, suddenly there's a disagreement. Let's transpose this to is the minimum a dollar or the minimum a penny, okay? I'm transposing it to American currency. So there's the argument, is a dollar or a penny, that's the minimum. Now, most people are going, well, dollar, penny, who cares? That seems like a, that sounds pedantic and picayune. It sounds irrelevant. But what I would encourage you to consider is look at the level of agreement they have. That means everyone agrees that a dollar or more that she is mikudeshes, she is betrothed, she's married, and anything less than a penny, there's no kedushin, she's not married. So that's where the disagreement is. And the in our faith tradition, we not only record what is the consensus and what we agree on, but we always put in dissenting views. We want all the dissenting views to be recorded because while we may not operate on the penny, we may opt for the dollar, we, may, we want to know what produced the minority opinion. And the scholars who study what the Supreme Court justices uh, you, you, in, the, in the United States. It's not only what the majority, what the five is, five judges, but people study the minority opinion, right? Because like, what was their thinking? How did they do that? That's what the Talmud does. So it's taking a principle that's in the Constitution, that's Tanakh. And then we're going, okay, let's apply this. It's like a memorandum of law from two sides. And then they had to say, is it close to this, close to that? So that, I think, will give you a better understanding of what's going on in the Mishnah. And then the Talmud is their students after 200. Thank you so much. Um, it'll be a miracle if we can get through these. <laughs> Indo, Matt could be using Nazarene to fulfill the prophecy of Jesus being disliked and oppressed. Nazarenes were associated with being disliked and hated. Your thoughts? Okay, so it's a different word. I'm not 100% sure I understand the question, but I think you mean someone who takes a a, 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 a Nazarite vow is what I, I'm pretty sure you're talking about. So this is so cute. This is very cute. This is adorable. This is like a... This is like a very important piece. So it's interesting, when you anglicize these words, they sound the same. Nazareth, Nazarite. Sounds similar to me. How about you? But as it turns out, two different words, different words, but in the English, when you anglicize them, it's lost. So Nazareth in Hebrew is Nazareth with a tzadi. A nazir is with a zayin, with the equivalent of a, a z. So they really are uh, very different words. Now that said, the idea that Nazareth was a backwater, one-horse town that you know that does that is an idea that's definitely in the Christian Bible, Nazareth. Scholars, uh, archaeologists believe they found it years ago. I have no reason to doubt it. Uh, but the idea that what good thing can come from Nazareth did make its way into the Christian Bible. So that is part of the way the Gospels portray Jesus, that he came from, he was born in a, in a manger, if you look at Luke's Gospel. He, was, he came like... A, a, a prophet is not without honor except from his own countrymen. That kind of refrain. The prologue of John, John 1.11, he came to his own, but they received him not. So the idea that he came from the most humble background and then made it, which is very attractive because that's like Superman. Like, that's perfect because I'm a nobody and Jesus overcame his enemies. I can't. He overcame the grave. I can't do that. And that's the attraction of Christianity. So I think, I, so there's no question 
though, that the idea that Nazareth is a lowly place is definitely part of the genre we find in the Gospels. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, hello, Tovia, Stop Scamming Man says. Have you any take on the authenticity or lack thereof of Maimonides' letter to Yemen? It's not my expertise. I, you know, that was a crazy time. Maimonides was born in 1235. Well, excuse me change that 1135 34 35 and he died in in 1204 in the winter of 1204 he lived during the time of the almohad which was an iteration of islam that was insane crazy and most germane is that the almohads thought that jews could be forced to convert to islam because the guarantee for jews that they were people of the book uh expires after 500 years and that's why Maimonides himself, Maimonides himself had to flee, and the Jews of Yemen were oppressed. Maimonides was able to address their questions of forced conversion. I should say that Muslims today disavowed this iteration as a um, a, as a heretical idea. The his letter to the Yemenite Jews is written in Judeo Arabic. So um, that's not my field of expertise. Thank you. Abri or Abri Von Zill, Roman 10 is saying Jesus will do it. So don't even think about, say, if you or who can do it. So I imagine, you know, you were talking about he eviscerated this part about you can do it. Um, this super chat is trying to say Romans 10 is saying Jesus will do it. So don't even think about, say, if you or who can do it. Paul's goal makes the quote appropriate. Right, that's the problem. That that highlights the problem that you Romans wants to convey that Jesus can do it and you can't. That you're a sinner, you're lost. Romans three, Romans everything. Right, that's exactly what he'll do. It's just that idea does not comport with is opposed by the Hebrew Bible. That's the problem. He is saying who will go up for us to heaven. That's Christ. Who will go for the sea is Christ. Precisely. And therefore, the question then becomes, why did Paul end with the word is near to you in your mouth and in your heart? Hard stop. Like, Why not trust your readers in Rome to finish the verse? Why leave out the point that you can do it? So that's, that's the problem. So, right, we know why Paul did it. What he is saying is, is proto-Orthodox thinking, that you're a sinner, you're lost, there's no hope for you, and only Jesus could fulfill the law for you, and that's how they read Matthew's, um, 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 Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon of the Mount. Right? right, so why not just tell me the verse? Like, why not? Why cut it off? Why cut out that critical point? The Torah's view is that you can do it, right? Paul's view is you can't do it. So this is exactly the conundrum that the Jew faces. We're not anti-Christian. It might sound that way. We're just going, if I have to choose between Moses, where Moses says you can do it, not Christ, there's no mention of that during there, and Paul says you can't do it, I'm going with Moses on this one. Nothing personal, Paul. So if you're hearing Jewish people uh, speaking about the Christian religion in a way that's unflattering. It's not personal. It's just, Jews people going, well, where did you come up with that? These ideas are not in the Hebrew Bible. We're going with Moses. And why did Paul leave it out? We know why. You're right. It's naked. Paul left it out because Jesus could do it, does it for you. Why does he do it for you? Because he's perfect and sinless. By the way, here's what I think you should ask. And that is, you know what? But if he was... I don't think Paul believed that Jesus was born to a virgin, but if I was the son of God, I wouldn't sin either. Like, what's the big deal? If you're the son of God, like, what what exactly are you going to do wrong? Like, what's the big deal? The point is we're human. We're You know, David, like, made real mistakes. If you're born to a virgin and you're the son of God, then big deal that you didn't. But don't get angry at me. 
But big deal that you didn't go into a gay bar in New Orleans. You're the son of God, right? The whole point is that you're not, your faith is not, then you're, there's no test. Oh, but he was tempted in the wilderness, what? To eat stone, to eat bread? But that's, it's not real. So, right, that's the point. We know why Paul did. We, it's not, this, this is not a mistake. For example, we have mistakes in the Christian Bible for which there's no logical reason. There are, I'm not going to go through it now, but there are just plain, simple mistakes. People make mistakes. Those are not important to me. These are not mistakes. These are very deliberate. They're there in order to persuade the people reading these letters they should believe in the tens of Christianity rather than the Hebrew Bible. Thank you for that super chat, Aubrey. Austin James were the apostles Torah observant. Well, you ask me, were they? I, I have no I have no sources for that. As far as the Christian Bible is concerned, they are this is a very interesting thing. So as far as the Christian Bible is concerned, they were Torah observant. Now there are times when the Pharisee, the Jews, see the the followers of Jesus doing something that they thought wasn't correct, like pulling up, you know, wheat on the Sabbath, which would be forbidden act. But it's so this is ve- this is very intriguing. This is like at the end of Mark chapter two as an example. So Jesus, in defending their behavior, because you're not allowed to pull in like harvest food on the Sabbath, that's forbidden. So Jesus' response was completely within Jewish law. He said, isn't it true that King that David, when he was on the run, that he ate from showbread, bread that an ordinary person was not allowed to eat from, right? That was That's a great answer, which means that King David's life was in danger, and therefore he was allowed to break the law. That's using rabbinic thought in order to respond to his detractors. And I have a whole chapter in volume one just on this entire topic. This is very interesting. And I, I, I don't I don't think I've ever said this on air, but this is very intriguing. So Jesus actually is working within the uh, constraints of Jewish law, rabbinic law, to explain to his opponents of why what his followers are doing is correct. And he would be right, because if their life was in danger on the Sabbath, you'd be able to violate any law to save a life. Now, here's something so interesting. So Mark, we talk about as our earliest gospel. But there's no question that there's an earlier gospel that doesn't survive because the author of Mark doesn't stop there. He could have, but he then has a commentary, and he ends the chat by saying, therefore, Jesus is the Lord over the Sabbath. Holy smokes, where did that come from? So that's a comment. That's not Jesus talking. That's the narrator talking. That's where we could see an example where the narrator is inserting an antinomian idea that really Sabbath has been done away with. But it's wrong. That means the author of the book of Mark doesn't understand the book of Mark. I know it sounds crazy, but the narrator who adds the comment at the end really didn't get how elegant that conversation is. And we see this antinomian view popping all over Mark. Mark 7, it's not what enters your mouth and defiles you, comes out of your mouth. So these are all antinomian ideas that, of course, have their precedent in Paul's letters that are earlier. But here's an example, a crazy example, where the editor of the book of Mark did not understand the canvas upon which he was painting. He no doubt had the story from an earlier source, and then he puts an antinomian comment at the very end. Great question. Hmm. I think Dennis McDonald might want to hear that one because he's been working on Q lately and he's got some interesting things that I think what you just said would tap into. This Equal is an st- insane topic. Insane yeah. topic. St- Equal stuff scandals. that's so radioactive. I apologize. There's no, stuff in Mark that's so radioactive that Matthew and Luke won't touch it. There right. is stuff like that. Anyway, yeah. just, right. Thank you. Thank you. Equal scales. Rabbi, the prayer Nishbat Kol Chai recited every Shabbat is to be attributed to Rabbi Shimon uh, Kephas. Thoughts? Peter, 
That's legendary. I don't know if it's true or not. So this, right now, none of your viewers are going to watch reruns of I Love Lucy. So there is a legend that Peter infiltrated the church and he didn't believe in any of it. And he infiltrated the church in order to get the church away from the Jewish community. Okay, This is a legend. I don't know if it's true. It's one of these very strong legends. There are sources for it, but I can't say that this is true. But essentially, the look, the word Christianity doesn't appear in the Christian Bible. The word Christian appears three times in the Christian Bible, and it's never used by a Christian. So it's, it follows, it, it is not a stretch to think that the earliest Christians just saw themselves as Jews, but another iteration of of Judaism. Uh, but that was problematic, and that Peter was sent in to infiltrate the church and then pull the church away, this young fledgling church, away from the synagogue. And if the this is legendary, and there's some people who don't like this, but it's there are sources, they're just not hard sources, that in fact, Peter, his name was Shimon, just asked that he would be assured a place in the world to come if he would carry out this task. And that maybe explains, according to following the legend, that why Peter is odd in the Christian Bible. In some ways, he's very important. He's the rock. In the other ways, he's a, he's the bumbling guy who's always making mistakes and denying Christ. It, that might explain it, maybe. But the key is then the l legend has it further. Legend, very important, that he is the author of Nishmas Kochai to Shimcha, that the soul of, I have to translate that, of every being uh, praises your name. So that's that's how the legend goes. Do I know if it's true? I have, I have no idea. But it's a very big legend. Very big legend. Huge. Thank you. Thank you. Dustin Folk, thank you for the super sticker, my friend. I appreciate the love. For Forocker. Could Paul's vision of Jesus be more attributed to his Hellenistic background rather than anything else? I think about this a lot. Um, and not many Orthodox rabbis do. So I don't think that Paul had a non veridical experience. I hope you got all those words in. I don't I don't think Paul like, had an experience that he misunderstood. That's what I mean by non veridical. I don't think he had any of that. I think he was a very much a Joseph Smith character. Okay. I mean, Joseph Smith didn't like, he wasn't walking around upstate New York and just thought he encountered an angel. No. All right. So that's how I think about Paul. Now, I, but I want to add a little color to that, what I think is going on here. In that, in the ancient world, and that's why I like when you, you describe the hell in the, the Hellenistic world, people talk that way. And you're going to get it, you, the viewer, are going to get it because presumably you've been exposed to the Pentecostal charismatic movement. That's a fast-growing movement in all over the world. Uh, and Assemblies of God is an example. So if you've ever been around Pentecostals, how do they talk? They go, the Lord spoke to me, you know, laid it on my heart. People, perfectly normal people say this stuff. Now, I'm not talking that people who just make up stuff, like, you know, my head exploded and then it came back. I'm not talking weird, crazy stuff. I, but because there's a lot of chicanery in that movement. But among normal people, once you're in that kind of, um, in that world, Tertullian actually belonged to a, a group that had this kind of like, I just received a prophecy, the Lord spoke to me. People, so that's what I think Paul lived in a in a universe that people just talk that way, you know, laid it on my heart. I felt the Lord came to me. And every one of you watching this, unless you're from Jerusalem, have met people who are normal people who talk that way. And it's not like they're lying, but they kind of know it wasn't really a voice. But and the, and what what I have viewed in my life doing what I do for well over forty years is that there are people then just exaggerate the story. The story just becomes 
more and more embellished as time goes on. But that's what I think. I, Paul, but Paul was very, very much a Joseph Smith kind of figure. He did not have a non veridical experience, in my view. He, But he lived in a world where people just talk that way. And remember, in the ancient world, I mean, people talk that way now, and this is common. Imagine the ancient world where people couldn't explain stuff, where people would, you know, there really was a God of the gaps. I mean, people didn't know a whole lot about anything. So in that world, certainly people just felt something and they, you know, the Lord is speaking to me. They didn't know what lightning was. They didn't understand what an earthquake was. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's what I think. Thank you so much. Radar Apologetics. Rabbi Tovia Singer, I would love to have a discussion with you on whether Jesus was the Jewish Messiah or whether Paul was antinomian. Perhaps a moderated debate? Let me know if you're down. I don't know who this person is. But, I don't know uh, who they are yet either. Well, yeah, I, look, I do them live, and it means in person, and all my debates are moderated. Um, but I have I don't I don't know who you are. So, but and I'm not going to say more. But there might be some juicy things coming up um, this summer. But yeah, fingers are crossed. We can make a debate stuff happen. Well, let's not say anything. We'll we'll leave it there. All right, all right. Aubrey Van Zyl. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Exodus four twenty two. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord: Israel is my son, my firstborn. firstborn. Isaiah forty nine. Yeah. Through elimination and substitution, defines the servant and Messiah as God's firstborn son. Whoa, where, where did that come from? You, I was with you there and then went. I, Isaiah 40 is like the most gorgeous, gorgeous, yummiest chapter, which contains a conversation between the righteous remnant of Israel and God. And God is saying, I've got a job for you. He literally addresses the servant as Israel in verse 3. And he says, I have a massive job for you. Like, what do you want me to do? Oh, you've got to um, you've got to bring about a redemption for the tribes of Jacob and be a light to the nations. And the servant goes, but everybody hates me. I'm despised of nations. Like, how am I going to do it? It's very much like a conversation between Moses and God. And and and. And the servant feels unworthy of this task. Remember, it's a twofold task. To save the rest of the Jews who are not religious, the tribes of Jacob, and to save the non-Jews, to be a light to nations. This is, if you want, you want to hear something beautiful, there's no Messiah, that stuff in there. But this is gorgeous, just if I may, may, because this is really simply exquisite. So the, the servant says, there's no way I can do this. Everybody hates me. How am I going to do this? And God uses um, an example of a nursing mother. He asks the question, verse 15, would a woman who's suckling her child, would she ever abandon the child of her womb? Well, the thought is, no, she's the mother. These two might forget, but I will never forget you. That's really beautiful stuff. Like, I, I so love you. I am so connected to you. And then I'll write you on the palms of my hands for all the world to say that I love you. This theme is, how does Isaiah 50 begin? Remember, guys, context, context. Isaiah 50 is more reassurance. How does Isaiah 50 begin? Now, all the Christians know Isaiah 53, but 50, because you feel rejected, despised, same language as Isaiah 53. Isaiah 50 begins with the first verse, when did I divorce you? Where's your bill of divorcement? Your safe accresus. Who did I sell you to? Which creditors did I sell you to? I never got rid of you. I'm just angry at you. So there's really gorgeous stuff. And I hope that something I am saying, I hope that I'm saying will inspire some of you to open it up and read it. The servant feels rejected, despised, and you'll see it continue in Isaiah 54, the woman who hasn't had a child. And, and God is saying, you can make it. You can make a difference in the world. I've got a mandate for you, and I never divorced you. I never sold you out. This is the most elegant use of biblical Hebrew in all of Tanakh. Thank you so much. 
Moving to TA, Matthew 23, 15, you travel over land and sea to win a single convert. Did Jews actively seek converts in the first century? I can't answer that. Um, I can. I. I don't know. Matthew twenty three. That's a. That's a. That's the 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 source where Jesus is. We are told to eviscerate. He's uh, telling the Jews that they they really are not good. It's, it's not a good chapter. We don't do well in that chapter. <laughs> um, I don't think so. I don't have a source for it because we don't when we don't proselytize. Um, so it it doesn't seem that way to me. I, but I can say there was not a group. You know, when I answer a question, I say here's the evidence. I can't say that there wasn't a group that was doing that, and we're not aware of a group. But we're not proselytizing because you don't need to be Jewish to be saved. So there'll be no reason. Would we want to spread this one God? Yeah, we'd want people to know about it, for sure. But there are there aren't sources for that. Most of the sources is that we shouldn't try to to proselytize others. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Brainache, was Paul Herodian? I could just tell you that he wasn't, I don't know. I, I just could tell you that he wasn't a Pharisee. That's all. He thought in Greek. He didn't just write in Greek. He thought that way. He quoted Greek writers, he was he a Rodian? I have I I just don't know. I mean, he claims. I think he pushes far in Philippians three when he claimed that he's a from the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. Like I don't know any Jew who introduces himself that way. Um, there uh, there were arguments that Paul wasn't Jewish. Maccabi in his very interesting work called The Myth Maker. I, I, I don't think that's correct. I think Paul was a, a highly, hel highly educated Hellenized Jew, but I have no... Uh, he was very pro-Roman. That's the key, and that's possibly... He was very pro-Roman. He Now, was he a citizen of Rome, as Acts claim, but Paul doesn't make that? I don't know. But his view on the Roman Empire was that the Roman Empire was put in place by God, and therefore you must dutifully uh, be respectful of it and not rebel against it, not because it's a bad idea, it's not pragmatic, but because um, you're, you're rebelling against God if you go up against the empire. Uh, that's Romans chapter 13, verse 1, 2, and 3. So that's very, there's very strong stuff in there. Paul is very, the whole of the Christian Bible is very pro-Roman, very, very much. So this is a huge topic. Thank you, thank you. Austin Sefton, I discussed Isaiah 53 with a pastor I know. He argues that there seems to be two servants in Isaiah 49, which gives runway for a messianic interpretation. Are there two servants in your view? I, I just would encourage people to read it, just read it for yourself. Uh, it, uh, God is addressing the servant who's the righteous remnant. If you want this thing really cool, and I know you're watching me on a computer, if you read these passages it's, it's, and you're a Christian, it's very possible that you'll take a deep breath. If you open Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12 through 16, if you did that now, it would blow your mind away. Zephaniah, who lived exactly where I am in Jerusalem, Zephaniah 3 describes the righteous remnant of the Jewish people. And we are told that I will leave in your midst a humble people who will dwell safely. It's a messianic passage. Zephaniah lived during the time of Jeremiah, same time. And um, and they'll be they will not commit iniquity. There'll be no uh, there will be no lies found in their mouths, and they'll dwell safely. And this is the humble remnant of Israel. It literally says that. So this is a parallel passage of Isaiah fifty three of Isaiah forty nine. This theme is all over. That means there's 
there's all kinds of Jews out there who whatever, right? Forget them. But there are some that are, are very devoted to God. That's the remnant. And if you want sort of an intimacy with these kinds of passages, I just recommend that Zephaniah, I know some of you viewers are doing this now, Zephaniah 3, 12 through 16. Then you have a parallel of Isaiah 3. You'll literally just stand there and stare at it. It's, but it, it's one thing, guys, listen carefully. Isaiah's 90% literally of Isaiah's poetry. Be very careful. Isaiah doesn't read anything like Joshua. So 66 chapters, only six of them are written using standard prose. So be careful with it. If you don't know the context, you're smoked, you're done. Watch my series on the book of Isaiah that I'm doing here in Jerusalem so you can study it. But almost all of it is poetry. It's not it doesn't read anything like the book of Judges. So be careful, because you're very susceptible with Isaiah if you don't read it in context. I'm just telling it straight away. Thank you, thank you. Aaron Smith, has Judaism always been monotheistic? Yes, of course. That's the core of our faith. Here, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. There is no one else besides me. Isaiah 46, verse 9 Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. You, our Lord, alone is God. I mean, this is like so powerful. Like, what do you need? Like, what do you need? So, yeah, so that's the essence. Now, I, I want to, if I may, just a point. People don't understand why monotheism is so critical. Like, who cares? Is this a numerate issue of just get the number right. And I think intuitively, and I think this applies to people who are religious and people who are not religious, people intuitively understand that if you don't believe in one God, but it doesn't really matter if you believe in five gods or 11 gods. It sort of doesn't matter anymore. It's either one or it doesn't matter. Why? So I want to convey this point. The, mo the radical monotheism of our faith tells us about the nature of God. If there's one God and no other, so that tells us about his character. He must be love and kindliness because he didn't have to create this world. There's nothing you have that he needs. This is very critical in Judaism. There's nothing you can do to make God's existence any better. He, he's eternal, but he's one alone. And therefore, the act of creating the world could have only been an act of complete love and mercy. The moment you injure the radical monotheism, you injure the, the power of God. That's why in Christianity, it's a damaged, highly damaged monotheism. And because of that, God in Christian thinking can't just forgive you if you confess and regret what you did. Someone had to die for your sins. Jesus had to pay the price. Why do I need Jesus to pay the price? Why can't God forgive me? After all, I forgave my kids for mistakes they've made. Am I more merciful than God? That's the damage. So the radical monotheism is that God, therefore, if he's one alone and there are no multiple persons in a Godhead, that means he must be love. Or else, how? what does he need this world for? So the oneness of God conveys the very character and nature of God. So great question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Next question is Aubrey again. Thank you for that super chat. Is Isaiah 53, regardless of who you think the servant is, implies atonement for sin is possible? Jesus was a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Atonement is not via law of Moses. I was right with you there, and then you went to Hebrews on me and left Isaiah. So the moment your plane went that way, I went, there's a problem, and the plane has to land. So Jesus being a high priest, okay, so that's that's from the book of Hebrews. That's a big deal in Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is the longest argument against Judaism in the entire Christian Bible. Okay, um, and Hebrews wants Jesus to be everything. So he's, I mean, look how the book of Hebrews begins. It's a new order. And Jesus is higher than angels. He's 
when Christians claim that the angel of the Lord is Jesus, the book of Hebrews begins by uh, the polemic against that idea. Hi, the Moses, Joshua, everything. He's the high priest. Now, he can be a Levitical high priest from like, like I'm a priest from the from Aaron uh, because he's supposedly from the house of David. So it's the priesthood of Melchizedek, and that's a um, a reference, an unambiguous reference to Genesis uh, 13, 14. But that priesthood means that you'll defeat your enemies, which is exactly what Jesus didn't do. He cross-references Psalm 110. So, right, there's nothing like that in Isaiah 53. And you see what happens is people just sort of mush it together. So Isaiah 53 uh, contains 12 passages. First eight is soliloquy of the Gentile nations. When the Messiah comes, what they're going to say when they realize they're all wrong. Verse 9 through 12 is, is God speaking and explaining what the whole deal is. So the Gentile nation is speaking, and they're saying two things. Number one, we realize now the servant who is Israel, Isaiah, as we talked a moment ago, 41, 42, 43, and so on. The servant is Israel. Number one, suffered as a result of our bad behavior. For the transgressions of my people, they were stricken, verse 8. And number two is that Jewish suffering triggers within the non-Jew a reason to... There are people who I have met who've whose views of God and views of the Jews change because of Jewish suffering. It has a very big impact. And there are many people who what, convert to Jews and become Noahites, whatever, because they saw what the Jewish people have gone through. By his stripes we were healed. So this is this is very important. Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 8 is a soliloquy. Remember Isaiah 52, verse 15. So shall he cast out my nations. Kings will shut their mouths. So the Gentile kings of nations pronouncing a twofold message. First, we can't believe what we're seeing. We surely, the, the servant got what we really deserved. We did it. And it triggered, he interceded on our behalf. We pray for them. And, uh, and then God resumes in verse 9, 10, 11, 12, the last four verses. It's really a gorgeous chapter. But you, if you, my friends, if you dare read any chapter in Isaiah without knowing the chapters that introduce it, you have no chance. And you're just going to follow the commentary of the person who you like. So if you want to take control of your life, I just say this to you, and you're dealing with Isaiah, you've got to read the context. Or you're just going to go, well, I like this rabbi, I don't like this rabbi, and my priest said, don't do that. Forget me. But read the chapters that introduce the chapter, or else you have no chance of understanding. This is not like Leviticus 11, where you can read it out of context and know that you're not supposed to eat a pig. Isaiah doesn't read anything like that. It is all poetry. Be very careful with it. We have eight more, and... Um... Hopefully we can get through these here. Uh, Inquisitive Mind, thank you for the super chat, says, in, in 3353, compulsory for Jews to live in Israel. I don't know what in 3353 is. I have no clue what in 33 is. Do you know what he's talking about? No. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it is that. A, it is a command. I mean, there are many commandments which could only be performed here in Israel. It broke Moses' heart that he could not come to the land of Israel to perform these commandments. So, um, Adam yeah. Green says, did Yeshu help bring the nations to Hashem? No. Is there been a greater stumbling block than Christianity, than Jesus? It, is there any religion that have pushed peoples to worship uh, three persons in a godhead and and become the most warlike of all nations and the greatest enemies of the Jewish people? There's has there been a, a people that have persecuted the children of Israel more than the church? Has there been wars that have been fought? Uh, 
that are more bloody than religious wars, than the wars that Christians engaged in. The bloodiest religious war in human history, in human history, was a war fought between Christians um, from 1618 to 1648. The Holy Roman Empire was eviscerated and it changed the way people thought about religion and God. Um, is that your idea of a Messiah? I don't think so. I encourage you to read Isaiah chapter 2. Mashiach will bring hechacha, rebuke to the nations, and they'll take, look at all the, the world today, tanks and and missiles and rockets. They'll be turned to plowshares and pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. When the tanks stop moving in Ukraine and in Israel, you'll know the Messiah is here. There's been no religion that has brought more war and unbelief and animosity towards the Jew than the church. And in fact, the Jew hatred that you see in the world that's not from Christians, it's all plagiarized from the church. All the church fathers hated us. The reformers did as well. So if that's your idea of Messiah, no thank you. Appreciate that. Aubrey again says, Isaiah 49, 6, servant cannot be the remnant because he must save them. Quote, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. Right. So we answer that. Remember that? So mm -hmm. I explained that there's two things that the servant, right? There are two things the servant have to do. They have to, l'hokim es shifte Yaakov, the righteous remnant the Jews who are faithful, we've got a whole bunch of Jews that aren't. I know this will come as a surprise to you that there should be Jews who are not religious, Jews who barely know that they're Jewish, Jews who are lost in India, who are coming back to Israel today, Jews from Ethiopia, Jews from all over the world that are lost, Jews in who are in in South Africa, Jews from the Lumba tribe, who we know now are from priestly families because of their DNA. The role of the remnant is to bring back what is Lahokim as Shifte Yaakov. They are to bring back the, to restore the tribes of Jacob. We're only two and a half tribes today. Nine and a half tribes have disappeared and there's a restoration. So no, it's not this is standard stuff. But you've got to you got to sniff this stuff out. I apologize, but this is standard Christian stuff. Well, Israel saves Israel. No, it's the remnant have two mandates. Mandate number 1 is to take care of the rest of Jacob, means all Israel. Number 2, how does it end? To be I gave for you to be Lor Goyim Lios Yeshuasi at Ketseyaras until the end of the world. So the role of the Jew is to be a light to the nations. So the religious Jews, I don't know how else to say it, have to bring back those Jews who are not religious. Right. It's not all of Israel saving all of Israel, it's a remnant saving the rest. Please, no more super chats to everybody. Um, they keep flowing in, and I keep putting the banner saying no more, and people keep throwing some more in here and there. And I understand you want to ask your questions. We will be doing a part two to the live stream next week. Right. Um, and the next one, of course, is continuing in the first question, which I think the questioner knew your position as a religious person. I want to make one point as someone who's an atheist, who's a skeptic. People in religious communities have certain ideas about things that I would disagree with. Um, your views on same-sex relationships and stuff will probably be different than mine. But I ended up having to block them from constantly doing the communication in the chat. And they say, Eunice and Cleon, it's not gay men who are broken. It's religious bigotry that needs to be fixed. So I understand this is your statement. I just wanted to bring the super chat up. I asked uh, up front like, to keep these things as courteous as possible. But they can, look I, at can I address that? I, I want to address that because I think it's a very valuable point. And this really affects me and my fellow rabbis. We talk about this constantly as we're doing it. So I want to make this very clear. Most people who are gay do not contact me or other rabbis. You can see the, the contact I would have with someone who comes to me is not a 
you know, a standard cutaway of any community, but it's rather people are coming to a rabbi because they want help. So let's just rehearse all this for a moment. Of course, there's a series of relationships that are uh, encouraged and others that are forbidden. That's just, you know, that's not, that's not a big secret. Right. But, but they would consider that, understand. I to, if I may, just to point out, yeah. some people are so staunch in progressively trying to push the movement. And I understand treating everyone equal and everyone needs to be treated equal. So much so that even if this is built into your religious system, that you think these things are not normal or they're not what is acceptable to Hashem, that I shouldn't even be talking to you. That you're a bigot. That's how far uh they're they're going is that you're just a bigot period and i guess everyone in history for the longest uh that held to these ideas were just purely bigot now right how would you how would you navigate i want to tell i want to tell you about randy okay okay this goes back many years randy was a jewish kid who wound up in the messianic movement he and i sat all night all night. I don't know. It was very late. And at the end of the conversation, he he figured out that his place was not a was not to be a Christian. And he said, I have a problem. Randy's words. Not yours, Randy's words. I've got a problem. And you're doing this long enough, you know it's gonna come. Okay, so I, you know, you want me to enter your world. I like you to enter my world. Okay, and he's saying I've got a problem. I say, well, what is it? And he he was very uncomfortable. And I don't remember his words, but it it ultimately came out that he said that he he he's attracted to other men. Okay. Now. He's he was really broken. He was broken. I'm not talking about a movement. I'm not I don't have relationships with movements. I have people come to me, they self-select to talk to me, communicate with me. And I said to him, You're very lucky. I envy you. Hey, what do you mean? I said, in truth, well this is what I told him, will God reward me for not having the relationship with another man? Probably not. It's not something I would choose. But you, this is something that you find attractive, right? But if you say that even though I do, this is a relationship that the Torah says is forbidden, you know how great your reward will be? That's what I told him. And he like was blown away by that. And he's living in Baltimore today. He has a beautiful family. But I explained to him, just coming for him, this was for Randy, not for you. It's for him. For him, it turned what he thought was a curse in his life, that he had this additional attraction to men. In that conversation, I conveyed to him that he had, in the Jewish view, a tremendous opportunity to go, wow, I, you know, I can serve God in a way that Rabbi Singer can. So... That's what I deal with. And, you know, at the end of my day, when I'm answering the emails and the calls and the people and talking to the people, but it's true. So that's why I said at the very beginning, what I think about is the people who come to me in their pain. Of course, right. there's a very unambiguous list of forbidden relationships in Leviticus 18. We all know that, but let's be adults about it. You're asking me, how does it strike me? That's how it strikes me. And if I may make a comment on this, just because I host you all the time, well, not all the time, but it's pretty common. I see you as a friend, and I enjoy these dialogues that we have. We have a lot in common on critiquing New Testament stuff. You know I don't see the uh, Hebrew Scriptures the same way that you do. You know that I don't believe the same way that you do. Uh, people go, well, how can you have them on without spending the entire episodes only trying to go after his foundations, his Scriptures? And I say, well, why do you think these shows go on? I mean— I do episodes that are critical of the Bible, and I'm not ashamed of that at all. But when we come on, I try to be respectful and find common ground. I'm not interested in debate. 
I'm not that kind of guy. You can go to other people's channels and find them. They're into that. I'm more into dialogue and then also critiquing something we can find common ground on. I'd speak to a Christian if we're critiquing Islam. I, I mean, I've had several Christian scholars on who may not be fundamentalist, but I'm more than happy to do the same. And I just think some people have a very narrow box in which who they think should be spoken to or have communication to. And I don't have that narrow of a box that if you have a certain outlook on life or Imagine if uh, someone's vegan, right, and it's built into your religion to eat meat. It's part of your religion, let's just say. Um, I shouldn't speak to you because, well, if I'm a vegan and I think harming any life, well, how dare you bring on this killer, this murderer of animals to talk to? How far do you go? And I'm just making a point that, you know, you're not – you don't hate uh, gays, right? Of course not. That's, that's, I mean, I'm just trying to make the point. Like, look, all we're look. All we're doing is is all I'm doing is helping people who have questions and and anyway, that's that was a pretty. With. And just, the, the, the vegan thing, you know, it's you know, the Torah in, enjoins us not to muzzle an ox in Deuteronomy twenty five four when it's treading right. Uh, like and it's Paul. That we'll talk about another time. That uses that as a fundraiser and asks the question: Does God care about animals? That's First uh, Corinthians nine, nine and ten. So, right, Paul's messing with the text. And I'm not. Right. Good point. Thank you. Thank you, Aubrey. What is the meaning of Hosea six two? After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. It's an interesting verse. Gets kind of touchy on the three-day thing we were talking about earlier, but it's not that. But go ahead. If you don't read it in context, you'll have no chance of this, but Hosea is addressing Ephraim. Please read it in context. Oh, for I will be like a lion to Ephraim. Look, read it just in context. Who's Hosea speaking to? Like, I am in Jerusalem right now. Hosea did not live here. Hosea was all the way in the north, near Lebanon, all the fun is. Hosea was addressing the northern kingdom. Ephraim was the lead tribe. So all you have to do is read in context rather than trust your cross-references. What's going to happen to the northern tribes that Hosea is addressing? They're going to be um, sent away. They're going to be lost. They're going to be destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. So they don't make it for the first day. The day here is referring to the epic of the temple, meaning the first temple. They don't make it to the end. Hosea lived during the Assyrian Empire as a contemporary of Isaiah, of Amos, of Micho. They all lived during the Assyrian Empire, roughly two centuries before the destruction of the first temple. So by the time we get to the destruction of the first temple, who's alive then? Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they lived during the Babylonian Empire. They don't even make the first day, in this case, the first temple. During the second temple period, the Jews returned back to the land of Israel, fulfilling the prophecy of Jeremiah 29, verse 10. And the second temple, was there, was there anyone, that's the second day, was there anyone from the northern kingdom, meaning the ten lost tribes present, the answer is no. They were lost for the second day. So please read the context or else you don't have a chance. What will happen in the third temple, the final temple, the messianic temple? I encourage you to read Isaiah 43, verse 6, 7, 8, the gathering of the lost tribes. Ezekiel 37, take two sticks. On one, write what? My friends, what do you write on one rod? You write Ephraim, Ephraim, same as here, and his companions. On the other right, Judah and his companion take two sticks, place them in your hand, and they become like one rod. What does that mean? That's the restoration of the lost tribes. So they will be revived. This is Ephraim, the lost tribes, in the, on the third day. And what Christian Bibles do is they do exactly that. So there is nothing on a Messiah being dying and then rising the third day from the tomb. So they take texts that's referring to the ten lost tribes and their restoration on the third day, meaning in the third commonwealth, which is to come, the restoration of the Jewish people. See Jeremiah 
23, verse 5 and 6. I hope when I say things like Jeremiah 23, 5, I hope you'll look it up. I hope someone will type it in the text bar so you guys can look this up. So there's a restoration. That's the third day. And I say this to you. If you don't read this stuff in context, the church is going to love you. If you read Hosea 6 in context, you're not even going to wait. You're going to contact your credit card company and ask them to halt payments <laughs> immediately. You'll just call MasterCard. You'll go online and just say, put a hold on the credit card. That's what you do. And in fact, it's Hosea 6.6. 6. It says, I delight not in sacrifice, but rather the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offering. See Micah 6.6. 6. So look, guys, listen. You got to read these book chapters in context. If you want to stay a Christian, do not do this. Do not read Isaiah 53 or Hosea 6 in context. If you like being a Christian, just read the selected passages out of context, and you will remain in your respective churches in good standing. Nothing to worry about. So if you like the way Jesus feels, don't read these in context. Conversely, if you want to know what the author is speaking about, whether you're a theist, whether you're agnostic or an atheist, but you just want to know what this literature is talking about, read it in context. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Stein says, Rabbi, can you explain your theory that Paul was a homosexual? What do you base this on? I I can't. My theory is for many years, I wonder, we talked about it on the show earlier, like you, like, Paul is cons consumed with sin, uh, consumed with the thorn in his flesh. He speaks about that. His, he's very aware of sin, something very shameful. And a chapter that's very moving or I think is very um, revealing is Paul's brief speech to fellow Jews in Rome, that's Romans chapter 7, where he talks about that when he discovered, when he himself discovered the law, that's when he died to sin. So, like, what what does that mean if he was just grew up in a Pharisaic family? His um, cherishing the celibate life and encouraging others to do the same. Now, it's important to mention that Paul uh, does encourage uh, families who are married, you know, husbands and wives, to love each other for sure. He's not saying to go married, but he believes that you know that people who are not married and so on just stay that way if you can be like me. It's and then he says it's better to be married than to burn. So if you can't, so to him the I, this is so. This is not the way Orthodox Jews talk, think. It's just not. You know, marriage is very, very valuable. This kind of talk, where does it come from? Like, why would he value? Now, we we could sniff this out in the gospel, so I'm not going to go into it unless someone asks. So you have to put this all together. What was it that bothered him so much? Like, what what would explain all this? Because this, although I... Um, I, I don't have a favorable view, Paul, um, but you have to wonder, like, and Paul was very, uh, uh, he liked Paul. <laughs> he wanted he wanted everyone to respect him. He's also, his expression about homosexuality in Romans, which goes further than the Torah, I mean, in Romans 1, it's not the only place where, you, but he's like very, he like, you know, there are people who are just just outrageous in the things that they say about homosexuality. Just very strong. Like, wh why that much? It's like a little much. So for many years, I go, what? What would explain all this? What would? Why would he feel such shame? Why would he feel this, this thorn in his flesh? What would be this shame? And this was, you know, you know, very much you know, Augustine. You know, confessed about his his troubled past and, and people struggle with this and mm -hmm. they know what to do with it and, and augustine's manichaeism where 
he look he 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 talks about it paul doesn't so i think that the best explanation of this is probably that paul struggled with his sexuality and i think that um and i think that in the empire just to finish off this piece it's very provocative in the empire homosexuality was you know people were in bed how the whole thing it was it was a part of the whole thing and i i talk i did a show where i talked about germania a very important work by tacitus we talks about how the germanic tribes who eventually he doesn't live to see it destroy rome they were more family in 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 the empire it was so i think that paul struggled with this that when he realized the magnitude of this that sinful relationship that 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 i think must have played a role in his life i can't be sure but that would explain everything that's why i think that thanks for your answer and yeah i made the comment earlier it could be due to the culture and the tradition as to why the shame is there to begin with a lot of people looking at the rest of their families and households and then i'm different i have an attraction in a different way and and i'm right. just built differently than the others so yeah, if your tradition is condemning a certain thing that you just so happen to be going down that path, you could see a reaction like Paul in the New Testament, potentially, if you psychoanalyze the words saying, why is he so against this thing? Maybe because he's fighting himself and he, he seems to be struggling with himself the whole time. Um, thank you so this much. Is a, a view, this is a view of, of Bishop Shelby Spong, uh, an Episcopalian priest. That was his view. I thought about that for a long time. And I'll tell you this, I've had that this conversation with many New Testament scholars, many of whom have appeared on your show. We just talk, uh, this is something that people really think about. We don't have the evidence, but you, you, you try yeah. to figure out, okay, but what's going on in his head? Believe me, this is conversation that people, that New Testament scholars have. Exactly. Like what would solve the issues? This is not weird stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Philip, David Phillip, thanks for the support. Appreciate that. Thanks for being here. Gnostic informant. I think I know this guy. Neil says, Rabbi, can you name one thing Paul says in his seven authentic letters that makes you think he was raised at the foot of Gamaliel? Try hard no. to still man this. Is there anything? He he thought in Greek. He no, there, his um, he thought in Greek, he talked in Greek, he wrote in Greek. That's where his mind was. And in order to understand this, you you do have to come from the Jewish world. And in case you think I'm saying that because I want people to buy my books, I'm not. If you take your first course with any New Testament professor no matter where. The first thing you're going to hear day one is you can't understand Jesus unless you understand the Jewish world from which he emerged, which was Pharisaic. Because if you don't understand the context, the crucible from which Christian, you can't understand what's happening here. So um, this is critical to go to, when, you, when, when a, someone who's a religious Jew reads Paul, we're going, okay, this has no, there's no relationship between that and the Hebrew Bible, quite the contrary, right? Thank you, thank you. Equal scales, and then we have one more after this. Rabbi, what are your thoughts on the Islamic account of Jesus' crucifixion, given the contradictions between Christian and Jewish sources? The, the, the Quranic view of this, is that although it appears to you that uh, that Jesus was killed, he actually was never killed. It only uh, appeared that way. There's one passage like that in the Quran, and Surah four, verse one fifty-seven. I think. Um, what do I think of it? It's so Muslims think that Jesus was a, a prophet. They don't think he was the son of God or any of that stuff. Um, I mean, I mean, you're asking me how do I think that ever got into Islamic thinking? 
Just yeah, what are your thoughts on the Islamic account of Jesus's resurrection or crucifixion? Sorry, and the contradictions between right. Christian so they this is why Islam has been less anti-Semitic than Christianity. This is what I face more is because in from the Islamic view, the Jews didn't kill Jesus. And by the way, the context there is that you think you crucified him, you didn't. So the Jews are actually being addressed there quite explicitly. Um, I, I think, I, I can't, I'm not a scholar of Islam. I think about how that Muslims obviously believe the Quran is the word of God. But I don't know how that um, how that made it in. I Now, there are views among scholars who really know a lot about Islam. I'm not. You know, that who are not Muslims who think that it infiltrated Islam by some other uh, groups that thought the same thing. So there were ideas among Christians that Jesus was never killed and it only appeared that way. That was a big, big idea that because that it only actually the name of that iteration of Christianity is just it had just appeared to um, the proto Orthodox would fight against this. So those scholars say that this was barred from that. I am not a scholar of Islam. I, I just couldn't tell you. You'd have to figure that out. I can't tell you how that got into the Quran. I thought of it, just throwing it out there, there is in what, in what we call Gnostic materials where it appears that Jesus is crucified. Right, exactly. Like, exactly. Really was. I think that right, maybe it really that wasn't. Thing. Yeah. Because he's divine. Well, you know, right. As you can imagine, Muslims would find that offensive. But right, so the Gnostic Christians did not believe that Jesus was actually crucified. And mm -hmm. they believed that Jesus was just a deity and it only appeared that way. In fact, right. that's the... Name. There are quite a few iterations of Christianity that say that it 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 didn't happen. It's interesting. I definitely find it interesting. Uh, ben West is Isaiah nine five a messianic prophecy to begin with, and thank you for that last super chat. So no, it's about Chizkio Hezekiah. It's about a people who have been in darkness finally saw a great light. If you want the whole story, do read Isaiah 36 and 37. Um, the contrast is the northern kingdom there destroyed, carried off in three waves by the Assyrian Empire in the 14th year of Chizkiyahu. But what happens is the people who walk in darkness finally see a great light. What happens? Um, the Assyrian Empire surrounds Jerusalem, right where I am now. The Jews didn't have a chance. All of Judea was destroyed. I think you visited Lachish when you came to Israel with Neil. I, I think I did. did. Yeah, I think so. I think you did. So Lachish was destroyed south. All of Judea was destroyed. People on the apprehension that the Assyrian Empire only destroyed the north. They didn't destroy all of Judea except for Jerusalem. So imagine being here in Jerusalem where I am now, and you hear the soldiers on the outside of the walls. There is a remnant of that wall still in the old city of Jerusalem. And you think you're dead. You just don't know. You celebrate Passover, and you think this will be your last Passover. And you wake up the next morning, 15th day of the first month, and there's just silence. See First King, excuse me, Second Kings, chapter 18 and 19. Really, that's what I want you guys to do is to read the backstory. So they look over the wall and the entire Syrian empire has been destroyed. Um, so now what the Christian translators do here, and this is possibly the most, um, po possibly, we talked about verses that have been played with, texts that have been altered. So these may be the most played with texts. So every verb, it says, ki yelad yulad lanu, for a child was born to us, because Hezekiah came out of nowhere. I mean, his father was a really wicked guy. And it says a child was born to us. What do the Christian translators do? Either a child is born to us or a child shall be born to us. Be a child was given to us. What do you think the Christian Bibles do? They put it in the future tense. So they take a passage that's about something that happened in the past. They change the verbs, every verb from the future tense, excuse me, from the what's called the perfect tense into the imperfect tense. We'll just use the 
past tense into the future tense, and his name will be called, but it doesn't say that. Vayikra Shemai means his name was called. It's in the past tense because it has the, the vav. I don't want to go through the grammar, but it's in the past tense. So by changing all the verbs in this passage, it then looks like it's speaking about something that's going to happen that didn't happen yet, and then all those names are the, the name of God, and it's the uh, he's calling the, the God is calling the Prince of Peace. All these things. So if you change all the verbs, you're going to have a Christological passage. This is a later corruption, meaning that Isaiah nine six and seven or five and six, depending on what kind of Bible we use, would no one even thought to use that about Jesus at the time that the. New Testament was written, and that's why it's not quoted in the Christian Bible. Even though passages prior to this do appear in Matthew 4, I think, 16 through 18, uh, those appear, but, but not these, because someone later, second century, thought of, oh, we can play with this text too by changing the verbs around. So what was about Chizkyo is comes to a future prophecy about the Messiah who is who is divine. One point here, and that is, of course, it's messianic in the sense that had the Assyrian Empire succeeded in killing uh, Hezekiah, destroying him, then there could be no Messiah in the future. So this preserved the Davidic dynasty in a miraculous fashion, so that there could be a Mashiach. So, in a sense, this is messianic in that when the nation saw that Chizkyo saved them and Jerusalem was preserved, and therefore the Davidic dynasty is preserved, and of course the future Messiah is preserved, and this is alluded to in the following passage. So, you have to be very careful here. So, it is messianic, but not in the way that Christians want it to be messianic. Rabbi, this has been a heck of a time. I really appreciate you coming on and hanging out for part two. I'm sure there's plenty more on Paul that we can discuss and cover and go into context and diving deep. Uh, again, I appreciate you being here. I hope you stay safe. Uh, yeah. I hope. I, I think with most of our audience, we hope that what's happening right now over there ends soon and um, and the weapons are turned into plowshirds and peace. Yeah, that would be nice. So, yeah. That would yeah. be good. That would be really nice. That would Please be, is there any final words from you? And I want everyone, if you like Rabbi, go subscribe. If you don't, subscribe and go harass him. No, I'm just, uh, you know, you don't have to. So. That's, very, that's very thoughtful, Derek. Very, very <laughs> sweet. You know, it's always at those tender moments. And that's why I think many people, when having a funeral for their loved ones, want you to be the keynote speaker because they know that you can liven it up. Um, what I could say is um, that, the nation we were on October 6th do not exist any longer. The world has changed, and we have, as a people have changed, and I think in many ways the world has changed. So we're not the same. It's been a rebirth of a nation, and but this trauma goes on and on, and please do whatever your faith is, but keep us in your thoughts and your prayers that we should come to a moment when when the nation will not lift up sword against nation, and all the nations will speak in a pure speech, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. We look forward to that. So thank you for your thoughts. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the kindness, everybody. Um, we did get one super chat in the last second. Yay, didn't want, Yadin, uh, is it? I think it's Yadin. Forgive me. Zedek, what does the rabbi think about the sect at Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls? What's up, D? Uh, appreciate it. Last question, and we got to roll. What do I think about the sect that that was in Qumran? Yeah, I I think that they were a they were very dissatisfied with the corruption in the temple, and wanted they did everything they could possibly do to be as far away from what was happening in the temple. This is the first century, so Rome is in control of this land. Jerusalem is where the temple was where the money was, where the power was. It was a center of power. And they had felt that there was complete corruption. They gathered a library. Um, much of the Dead Sea Scrolls was not stuff that they wrote. Rather, they preserved. Uh, and 
They Qumran was destroyed in sixty eight. That means in the middle of the war, Qumran. But somehow that that library uh, was preserved. But it, they were apocalyptic eschatologists. That means they believed that the only way that the world could be saved, that Israel, that they could be saved, was through a sudden, sh stunning, shocking um, revelation from God that would end the empire which they wanted nothing to do with. And imagine how they felt about what was happening in the temple, the corruption that was there. It's, that part is very transparent, I think. It's very easy to understand. We don't have that many sources for the ASEANs, and if what happened in 1947 didn't happen, no one would ever talk about them. But now they're really interesting. Thank you for that question. Thanks so much, uh, Rabbi Tovi Singh. I really appreciate you and uh, everybody like the video and uh, stay tuned for the next live tomorrow. We're going live again. Have a good one.